Christ, and everybody said, Amen. Praise God. Well, I'd like to start this new year by reading a devotion by a preacher who uh, lived during the uh, 1800s, uh, early part, and uh, towards the end of the 1800s. And he wrote about the new year at that particular time. And this is what he said. The Bible's first promise, January 1st, by Charles Haddon Spurgeons. And I will put enmity between thee and a woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15. This is the first promise to fallen man. It contains the whole gospel and the essence of the covenant of grace. It has been in great measure fulfilled. The seed of the woman, even our Lord Jesus, was bruised in his heel, and a terrible bruising it was. How terrible will be the final bruising of the serpent's head. This was virtually done when Jesus took away sin, van vanquished death, and broke the power of Satan. But it awaits a still further and fuller accomplishment at our Lord's second advent in the day of judgment. To us, the promise stands as a prophecy that we shall be afflicted by the power of evil in our lower nature and thus bruised in our heel, but we shall triumph in Christ who sets his foot on the old serpent's head. Throughout this year, we may have to learn the first part of this promise by experience through the temptations of the devil and the unkindness of ungodly uh, who are his seed. They may so bruise us that we may limp and our sore, with our sore heel, but let us grasp the second part of the text and we shall not be dismayed. By faith, let us rejoice that we shall still reign in Christ Jesus, the woman's seed. In Jesus' name. What a great song that was sung earlier during our worship time. In Jesus' name. I will live, I will not die. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So let me... Uh, remind you, uh, as the Holy Spirit's conduit and vessel today, we are in a battle. And the enemy is the enemy of God. And it's our job to fight this battle. Our God and great Redeemer, from times past in the Garden of Eden, spoke to us of this battle and how important it is for us to realize that he has called us to be soldiers, soldiers of light, and we wear armor of light. Let me read to you from Romans 13, 12, 14. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let's rid ourselves of the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let's behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and debauchery, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. And, you know, when I would camp, I would camp our gear and our food and everything. We would, I would make provision for that camping trip. And what Paul is telling us is don't plan to be in the flesh. Don't plan to, to sin. And sometimes we... We plan, we make provisions so that we can fall into the trap of sin and addiction. And Christ is telling us through the writer of Paul, don't make provision for the flesh. Determine in your head to put on Jesus Christ. Listen to this, Ephesians 5, 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 6 says, But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons or children of light and children of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. This last several verses I read, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 6, gives us an exhortation about being attentive to the day we live in. We are in the end times, folks. If, if it was true back 2,000 years ago, how much more today are we at the point where Jesus is coming back soon? We are seeing the fulfillment of the narratives given by the Bible writers about the end times. Listen to this. Paul the Apostle describes to his spiritual son Timothy 
the condition of people in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Are, are there difficult times going on today? Probably more than ever before. Verse 2 says, For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, slanderers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, just gossip, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I, I'd say that's a pretty good narrative of our world today, isn't it? We see today so caught up with pleasing self that they've lost any sense of moral compass of what is right and wrong. They're doing, as the book of Judges says, they're doing what is right in their own eyes rather than what is right in the eyes of God. We're here, folks. In the last days, difficult times will come. We're seeing the very thing Paul expressed to Timothy happen. So my question today is, how then are we to act in these last days that we're living in? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll guide us and speak to us. Holy Spirit, come be our teacher. Minister to our spirit, our heart, and our mind. May we hear the word of God today. Guide us now. We pray, we ask this. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. To answer the question, how then are we to act in these last days? We can find an answer in the parable that uh, Pastor David has been sharing from uh, in Luke chapter 8 uh, for the last oh, month or so that uh, he's been doing. Luke chapter 8 verses 11 through 15 if you want to follow along. Jesus said this, he explained the parable to his disciples. Now this is the parable. The seed is the word of God. And those beside the road are the ones who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Verse 13. Those on the rocky soil are the ones who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And yet these do not have a firm root or no roots. Some translations say they believe for a while and in a time of temptation, they fall away. And a seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they are checked or choked by worries, riches and pleasures of this life. And they bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word with a good and virtuous heart and hold it firmly and produce fruit with perseverance. Well, the soil conditions that are mentioned are really heart conditions. And they help us to understand the conditions that can overtake people in these end times, these last days that we're living in. And the first heart condition is unbelief. Verse 12 of Luke 8 says, And those beside the road are the ones who have heard... Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart, so they will not believe and be saved. And these are those who at one time or another have heard the word, heard the good news, and because of unbelief, never accept the good news. They're, they're like a pathway. They're, they're like dirt that has been trampled and hardened and seed is put upon it, but it can't penetrate the ground. It's so hard that the birds come and pluck the seed off and the enemy comes and he, and he robs the seed out of these people's lives because their hearts are hardened. They've, they've resisted the Holy Spirit. They've resisted what God is speaking to them. And I'm telling you, today is not the day for us to resist the Holy Spirit. Today is the day for us to listen to what the Spirit is speaking to the church. How important it is. Romans chapter 10, verse 8 through 11 says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes 
resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so I want to encourage each that is here today and those that are listening, believe in him. Don't let your heart become hardened. Unfortunately, there are people that, that um, feel that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to church. It's full of hypocrites. I've been hurt there. I just give up on the whole God thing. And, and they're missing what God has for them in their lives. Their heart has become hardened by bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness. Now, how important it is for us to, to have a heart that is tender, that is soft and available to the things of the Holy Spirit. Unbelief prevents them from accepting the good news. Number two, the second heart condition is weakness. Verse 13 of Luke says this, those on the rocky soil are the ones who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and yet they have no firm root or no root. They believe for a while, and in a time of temptation or testing, they fall away. These are those who receive the word that they don't grow. They don't allow God to take them through difficult times. And at all costs, they avoid any type of trying or testing. And, and folks, let me tell you, it's important for us to be available to whatever God takes us through. And sometimes he takes us through the hard times. There's, there's promises. Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of what? Death. I won't fear any evil. There's hard times. God is with us. He leads us and he helps us. And how important it is for us to realize that God is with us in everything we go through and, and he allows us to go through the difficult times so that we become strong in him and we know him. How can we know that God is a great deliverer unless we need delivering? How can we know that God is a great provider unless we are a lack of provision in our life that we experience? How can we know that is the great healer unless we allow him to take us into that time where, God, I cry out to you, please bring healing to my, my mind, my body. How important it is for us to be available to him. I, I, in this day and age with COVID rampant throughout our world, what an important time for us to see God as our peace where we allow him to speak to our heart, whether we're going through COVID or not, but that there's a peace that he gives. He is the Prince of Peace. There are those who receive the word, but they never grow. They don't allow God to take them through difficult times. Jesus makes commentary about people like that and Revelations chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, he speaks to the Laodicean church and he says this, Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy, and I have no need of anything, even you, Jesus. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me, Jesus says this, Gold refined by fire. And he's not talking about physical gold. He's talking about precious gold of intimacy, of relationship with him. Peter says it this way, that the trying of your faith is more precious than gold that's been tried by fire. There's a trying of the faith and we have to allow ourselves to experience those trials. We live in a society that says negate the intimacy with God. What do I mean by that? Well, find some other way. Don't talk to God. Take a loan out. Uh, go to the hospital. Do this, do that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't go to the hospital and we shouldn't, shouldn't look for provision, but are we praying like our life depends on it? Or are we defaulting to, to human means? Jesus said, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may 
clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I say, I have to apply to your eyes so that you may see. There are people that today are blind to the things of God because they're not willing to allow him to take them through some difficult times. Pastor David and I have been sharing from the book of Hebrews, I don't know, a couple of months now probably. And we always keep going back to this particular portion of scripture in James chapter 1. And it's James' exhortation to the church. And he says, consider it all joy, my brothers. This is James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you will be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. How can we be perfect and complete unless we go through the trials and yet what we do is we run the other way. Unwillingness to trust God causes this type of person to be weak and give up and to fall away. They don't have any root system. They've not, they've not had to grow deep in God. And they give up easily. Well, there's a third heart condition talked about in this parable in Luke chapter 8. And it's this. It's a heart condition of distractedness. Luke chapter 8 verse 14 says... And the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked by worries, riches, and pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. And so Jesus in this parable tells us there's three distractions. The first distraction is worries, cares, or anxieties. That's literally what that word worries means, is care and anxiety. And, and Paul, who <clears throat> had firsthand experience of worries and cares and, and uh, probably was very anxious from time to time. He writes this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. It's one of his prison letters that he wrote. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do you think this man was speaking from theory or experience. I think from experience. If we read the narrative of his life, he went from being this Pharisee of the Pharisee, Saul, who was consenting to the death of Stephen, to the point of being knocked down on the road to Damascus, his perspective of life being changed, recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. And because of that transformation, the rest of his life, he was persecuted by the religious people. He was beaten, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked. He was probably robbed a number of times. I'm sure there were times that he grew anxious. There were times where he was worried about things. And I suspect that this was a testimony of victory in his life. Don't be anxious for anything. But in everything by prayer, I'm, I'm sure when he wrote that, he, he fully understood what he meant by. But in everything by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. The enemy is trying everything he can to get God's people distracted with worry. Don't allow times of worry to go unchallenged. Where we aren't praying, pleading, and with thanksgiving, making our requests known to God. Don't allow those worries, those anxious times to come and, and, and assault us where we go, wait a minute, I'm not giving in to you. I'm praying, I'm in the name of Jesus, I'm pleading in the name of Jesus. And I'm thanking God for prayer that he has brought to a fruition in my life where there's answers that I can see. He's done this and this and this and this. Prayer, pleading, and thanksgiving are the bridges to God's guardhouse of peace. In my mind, when I wrote that, I was thinking of this, this massive fortress 
And there were three entrances. And the drawbridge came down when people began to pray in the name of Jesus. And another drawbridge came down when there was a pleading by the blood of Jesus. And then that third drawbridge came down because of people being thankful that God was their deliverer. And they were entered, able to enter into the guardhouse of peace where our minds are guarded. The peace of God that passes all understanding guards your heart and your mind. Well, there's a second distraction Jesus mentions in this parable. And it's a distraction of riches. And the word literally means to flow, abound, or wealth. And the enemy tries to distract God's people with riches. And riches can mean a flowing or an abounding in a sense, normalcy, a state of being normal. <laughs> we all heard a call to normalcy. Let's get back to normal. I, I want to encourage you folks, there is no normal. There's a new normal for a season, but then it goes on to another normal. Life is change. If you're living, change is taking place all the time. If you're dead, there's no change. None. But if you're living, there is change. And the, the, today, enjoy what you're going through. Today, appreciate what you have. Today, enjoy the people that you're around because change comes and change is coming to this world. People that declare, I just wish things would get back to normal. You're not living in the real world. Do we allow a desire to have normalcy be a distraction that chokes out God's word from being fruitful in our lives? Listen to Paul again. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with little, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And this is a verse we all know. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <coughs> That's the secret. That's what Paul declared to the church at Philippi. Here's the secret. This is how I've learned to be content in one other, whatever circumstance. I can do all things through Christ. And so when, when peril comes, Lord, you're with me. I can do all things because you're with me. You'll give me wisdom. You'll help me to know what I need to do. When we go into times of sickness, Lord. You're with me. I can do all things through you. And even though I feel rotten like I'm going to die, you're with me. And I can do this. When we go through a transition of, of change, of work or no work or, or, or bills and, and not having the money, Lord, I can do all things through you who strengthen me. Help me, O oh God, in this. And, and that's where that prayer and pleading with thanksgiving goes up. God will come through. A lack of normalcy invites intimacy with God. Let me say that again. A lack of normalcy invites intimacy with God. He's our refuge. He's our high tower. He is our provider, protector, and great shepherd. And how can we know those things about him unless we get knocked off of our normal routine and something takes place and we go, God, please. Well, there's a third distraction that Jesus talks about in this parable, and it's, that is the pleasures of this life. Literally, it means to enjoy oneself. I don't think there's anything wrong with enjoying ourselves. But sometimes what we do is we get sucked into enjoying ourselves way too much. And we forget that in this world, we have been called to be soldiers of the light. 
And the enemy tries to distract God's people with the pleasures of this life. This world is not our home. God is something better for His children. And this world and the things that are in it are to be used for God's glory and benefit. He's called us to be stewards over what He's given us. And yet we live as if it belongs to us. It isn't ours. It's His. And He allows us to use the things we have. One of the things Pastor David was mentioning earlier about our tithes. It's His. Why, why do we rob God of His tithe, His 10%? We think we own it. God can do more with your 90% that you have left over than the 100% you think you have to have all to yourself. Learn the lesson, folks. You're a steward over what God has given you. It's all His. It belongs to Him, period. Let me give you an example. One taken from nature. I, I enjoy honey. Matter of fact, when we get some biscuits, I like honey and butter on it. it tastes pretty good. i got to be careful. Some of you, it's lunchtime. I realize that. Honey's a wonderful thing. Some call it a perfect food. Well, bees know how to use honey for its benefit. However, if you take a fly, it doesn't know how to use honey and can and will probably die from mishandling it. I've, I've watched flies come and land near a, a drop of honey and, and they'll start to get close to it and they'll, they'll taste it and they'll go, oh, that, that tastes pretty good. And they're so excited about getting to the honey that they put a foot into the honey. And, and they start trying to pull it out, and they, they really can't. And, and then they get another foot stuck in it, and pretty soon a wing tip gets stuck in it. And then you see that fly start to buzz around, and he, and he just gets mucked up with the honey. And eventually, if you look back, there he is. He's dead in the midst of the honey. He drowns from the honey. <coughs> I wonder how many Christians get drowned in the honey of this life. God's given us provisions in this life to use for our benefit for His glory. Which nature are we operating in? Bee or fly? Spirit or flesh? Are we using the things of this world for God's benefit and glory or our, for our own benefit, for our own glory? You know, as we take a look at these three distractions... that we've talked about. They really do a lot of damage to our lives. The result is, is that it chokes out the word of God. It chokes out the life of Jesus. And we forget about him and live only for self and we end our life miserably. If you're listening today, you're here in the sanctuary and you have allowed the things of this world, the worries, the anxieties, the unbelief, the things of this world to choke out God. Now's the time to start getting rid of those things and say, God, please, I, I nurture in me the word again that I will be fruitful. Heart conditions that we've talked about so far, the results, they, they bring no maturity. They don't bring anything of perfection. They don't produce any perfect offspring. It's all for self. It's all what I can get. I don't care about anybody else. And God has called us to be a people that are fruitful, people that are available to him. And Jesus said this fourth heart condition, the honest, the good, produced fruit was steadfastness. And I want you to hear what Paul says in Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become discouraged in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not become weary. First three heart conditions, unbelief, weakness, distractedness, they brought loss. And only the fourth heart condition 
being honest and good brought gain. Let me read this. Paul writes Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 from, I believe, a corrected perspective. He had to get refocused. And maybe some of you here today need to be refocused. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 says this, But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish so that I may gain Christ. What a paradigm shift in his life. These things that he thought were gained to him, he realized that they were rubbish because of knowing Jesus, gaining Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have called us, that you're very persistent in your love for us. And you've planted seed within our hearts. And Lord, help us to not have hard hearts where your word is taken out as quickly as it's put there. Lord, help us to not be people who, who aren't willing to grow and, and walk through the times with you so that we can develop a root system that keeps us in you. And Lord, I pray that your word would not get choked out of our hearts and minds because of the things of this world. Unbelief. Fear, cares. God, I pray that you'll help us to nurture the word that you put in it on our spirit. That we'll be good farmers in a sense and we'll pull the weeds out and we'll water and, and nurture so that the seed of God can grow and we produce much fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. I pray that you'd help us, the church, to hear what the Spirit is speaking to us. I ask and I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you'd stand with me, there's a song that, uh, Don, if you could come to the piano. And uh, it's, it's a song that I learned from uh, Promise Keepers years ago. Uh, there's something amazing about seeing five to 10,000 men together when you're in an auditorium and there's all men there singing with all that they have. And maybe you know the words. If not, listen to them and make it your prayer. All I once held dear built my life upon all this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now, compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Let's sing it one more time. All I once held dear, built my life upon. All this world reveres and wars to home. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus, Knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're 
are my best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. And I love you, Lord. Yes, I love you, Lord. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll help us to be a people who press on to know you. To know you, O oh God, and the power and anointing where we can declare your word properly. To know you as our strength in time of weakness, our hope in time of trouble, our Prince of Peace in time of chaos. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And may you receive from us honor and glory and praise in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. Have a good week in Jesus Christ.